Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. My name is Jamal Whitehead, and I'm here today on behalf of Troy Coachman. Uh, Your Honors, this was a seven-day jury trial resulting in a unanimous verdict. There was no objection as the jury was impaneled. There was no objection to the jury instructions or a contention that the, the jury was improperly instructed. No objection during opening, closing, rebuttal, uh, as the case was given to the jury. It was only after an adverse verdict was returned that Mercedes took issue uh, and did so in uh, the vehicle of a Rule 59 motion contending that Mr. Coachman had made some type of improper argument uh, and that had led to a, an excessive verdict. Uh, on review of the motion, the trial court found that um, there was substantial evidence supporting the verdict and that no improper argument had occurred. This court is loath to disturb the district court's uh, determination about the sufficiency of the evidence uh, and uh, defers to the district court under all but the most narrow of circumstances, none of which are applicable here, and certainly none uh, that approach the extraordinary relief sought by Mercedes in the form of new Washington law uh, dictating some hard and fast ratio, uh, mathematic computation uh, between economic and non-economic damages. Uh, we talked a, a lot, and I heard Mr. Goodfriend talk a lot about uh, the argument during closing, but argument is not evidence. Uh, liability is not contested in this case, so I won't talk about how Mercedes fired Mr. Coachman because of his disability, but there was substantial evidence that came out at trial about Mr. Coachman's emotional harms. And the jury heard from his family, his friends, his medical personnel, uh, former colleagues, about how Mercedes' conduct cut Mr. Coachman to his core, about how it disrupted his worldview. This was a man that was called Mr. Mercedes because he was so closely identified with the brand and it meant that much to him. He was one of the very best at what he did, uh, but when he had uh, developed cancer and had his vocal cords removed and a vocal prosthetic installed, the company essentially told him that he was a monster, uh, that he was not fit to work with its customers, asking him to wear an ascot to hide his stoma, to hide his voice prosthetic, uh, telling him that he could not speak after he'd worked so hard and so diligently to teach himself how to speak again. Uh, the fear and anxiety that resulted from losing his job, uh, which also resulted in him losing his disability benefits, was, was palpable. And the jury heard about all of this. Uh, they'd heard about how, as Mr. Coachman battled cancer initially, uh, that he was hopeful and that work was one of the things that kept him going and motivated him to get better. And that how, when his job was taken from him, that a piece of Mr. Coachman was taken as well. Uh, the jury heard uh, from Mr. Coachman's uh, medical team uh, and his counselor about how Mr. Coachman's traumatic upbringing made him especially susceptible to the type of betrayal that Mercedes inflicted upon him, uh, and that he was especially susceptible uh, to emotional harm firing from this, this type of event. So at the end of the day, Your Honors, the, the verdict was large because the harm they inflicted was large. And telling the jury about these harms isn't an appeal to passion or prejudice, but just a recounting uh, of the facts of the case. So, you know, we're talking about, um, you said, uh, Judge Presnell, one page in a 30-page uh, uh, closing argument. It really boils down to 12 lines. And when you look at uh, this argument in context, we're talking about RP 1199, it's important to read RP 1198, 97, 96, so on and so forth, putting this argument uh, into context. And it's clear that this is no appeal for punitive damages. There's, there's no call to punish Mercedes for its conduct, to get back at Mercedes for what it had done uh, to Mr. Coachman. There, there is no call to hurt Mercedes, to deter it from doing the same thing to other employees. This is not a call for disgor disgorgement. There's no suggestion that Mercedes was wrong from retaining the benefit of Mr. Coachman's work or that it would be unlawful uh, for the company to keep it under the circumstances. I mean, really what we're talking about uh, was a framework, an argument uh, suggested by counsel for the jury to think about something that is difficult to calculate, right? That's acknowledged on the face of the jury instructions that Mercedes did not object to. There is no fixed standard for calculating uh, emotional distress damages. So uh, counsel, if I may ask you a question, Mr. Whitehead. In, in this kind of practice uh, of such a claim for emotional distress damages or non-economic damages, is there a general practice or custom 
as to how an advocate would normally prove that your honor it's through the evidence and that's why i began with sort of the recitation of the facts that came out it's not that the jury is completely untethered they're instructed to use their judgment in view of the evidence a deuce to trial to come up with a number that was fair and in this case the jury was instructed to consider nine different aspects of emotional harm and that's exactly what they did at the conclusion of trial mr coachman valued his damages at nine million dollars nine million plus actually that was the number that was put to the jury the jury came back with a number that was half that amount which suggests that the jury disregarded the argument of counsel and that it went about its work in a serious and thoughtful manner and reached a number that was based on the evidence uh... that that came out at trial thank you so this notion that uh... economic damages and non-economic damages must come in in some set ratio uh... simply uh... there, there is no case that holds that solely on the basis of an economic ratio uh... that remitted or should be granted uh, and mercedes has, has not cited a case no case exists and no case should because in a, a case like this a discrimination case where all acknowledge that there's a, a an opportunity for a disparity between non-economic and economic damages it would unfairly penalize those low-wage earners or people like mr coachman who after uh, uh, several months after he was fired was rendered unable to work so to limit the recovery of his emotional distress damages simply because he could no longer earn uh... It would be to do him an injustice or in the case of uh... say for example severe or egregious sexual harassment where there is no wage loss to tell that person that they're not entitled or that their emotional distress damages are cabin irrespective of the evidence of their emotional harm uh, would be unfair and the rule that mercedes is advocating for would fall especially hard on uh... people of color uh... women uh... disabled people uh, people that historically earn less uh... uh... In, in terms of the majority workforce so your honors at the end of the day what we have is a jury that was properly instructed uh, that heard substantial evidence of uh, Mr. Coachman's emotional harm. And Judge Presnell, as you pointed out, that all went unrebutted by Mercedes. They put on no counter evidence. Uh, there was no counter argument. Uh, there was no counter suggestion to the jury about how it might go about its work of calculating the damages. Uh, the absence of which was so conspicuous that uh, the trial judge even noted in his order, uh, denying remitter, denying the new trial, uh, that Mercedes. Uh, made a strategic choice not to argue damages. In this instance, Mercedes made its bed and, and shouldn't be heard to complain that the bed is lumpy. So w what we have uh, is a, a trial judge um, denying a motion for remitter, uh, and this court, uh, the standard being abuse of discretion and looking for a clear abuse of discretion, meaning the absolute absence of evidence or a, a wholly implausible or improbable result. That just simply is not the case here. Uh, for that reason, Your Honors, we ask that you affirm. Thank you very much.